Good morning. Welcome to worship today. I'm so glad to see all of you here and a special welcome to our visitors today. We're glad to have you worshiping with us on a joyous day. The best thing I do as a pastor is, is get to baptize new children of God. It is such a blessing and, and an honor and privilege and so we're thrilled to have that happening here today. Um, wanted to just announce a couple of things. First of all, um, um, as many of you have heard, Mary Ann Lane is, has taken a second fall, and uh, it was a, a serious one this time. Her brain stem was bruised, and so she um, is unconscious, and um, it's very serious, so we ask for prayer for her. Also wanted to add to our prayer list Daniel Palmer, who is Denise Heinrich's uh, nephew, who had a serious fall and is um, currently hospitalized with um, paralysis of his legs, but praying that that is going to be reversible. But he, he has a long road of rehab and recovery ahead, so we're praying for him as well. Uh, if you're a visitor and you didn't get a chance to do this, please sign our guest book in the back of the church as you go out today. Um, also, a couple of reminders of things that are upcoming. Uh, we have a movie night next Sunday evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, we will be showing Miracles from Heaven, which if you have not seen it, it's a fantastic uh, movie based on a true story. And that'll happen at 7 o'clock. We'll have goodies and popcorn and all the things for you and bring whoever you would like. Any friends or neighbors are all welcome for the movie night. If you were here um, before church and happened to notice on the screen, we had a slideshow running of pictures, and that is part of our Water for Kids project. Those were pictures of the first well that was actually given by us. So those were pictures of our well that's now dug and opened and people drinking and getting water from the well that we dug. And you'll uh, see in the bulletin, if you haven't already, that our total uh, for our congregation was $29,081. So basically three wells were dug in our name and then of our eight congregations that were working together, we, we've almost gotten to $90,000. So nine wells, which is such a blessing. So um, does anybody have any other announcements this morning? All right, if not, uh, what we do is every Sunday we have a time of confession and forgiveness. And the reason we do this is because every week, every day, probably every hour, we all do things that are sinful and wrong. And so we come before our gracious Heavenly Father to ask for forgiveness and to receive forgiveness. So please stand as you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. 
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our opening hymn is Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty, which is number 533 in the red hymnal. Our tradition here is uh, on this opening hymn, we will remain seated until the last verse, and then we stand for the last verse. love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, 
for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Let us pray. God of mercy and tender compassion, through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, the depth and breadth of your mercy is profoundly revealed. By your Spirit, empower us to lead lives that are faithful reflections of your own gracious mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson comes from the book of Leviticus. The 18th chapter, verses 1 through 5. The 19th chapter, verses 9 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. You must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the death or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God, I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against anyone among your neighbors, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. 
The word of the Lord. Our responsive psalm for this week is Psalm 41. Blessed are those who regard the weak, for the Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over to the desires of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed and restores them from their bed of illness. I said, have mercy on me, Lord, heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? When one of them comes to see me, he speaks falsely, while his heart gathers slander. Then he goes out and spreads it around. All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst for me, saying, a vile disease has afflicted him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. But may you have mercy on me, Lord. Raise me up that I may repay them. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Our second lesson comes from the book of Colossians, beginning at the first chapter, verse, or first chapter, verse 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossa, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up in you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. That has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understand God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow, fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of the God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified to share, qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I'll bet most of you have heard of the movie Jaws, right? The blockbuster 1970s hit about a giant great white shark attacking swimmers on Martha's Vineyard. Even if you haven't seen the movie, it's ominous music probably popped into your head as soon as I mentioned it, right? After the enormous success of this movie, multiple sequels were made for the next decade or so. One of them, called Jaws the Revenge, was advertised with this tagline, this time, it's personal. You ever heard that? <laughs> this time, it's personal. When somebody speaks those words, it usually means someone they care about has been hurt, and they're getting ready to take their revenge. And whether you're watching an episode of Gunsmoke, or a Star Wars movie, or a Disney classic, in the end, the good guys will triumph, the bad guys, or bad shark, will be punished, and the hero and heroine will ride or sail off into the sunset together. That's the way it works in the movies. And that's the way we think it should work in our real lives, too. We sort of expect that the bad guys will get what they deserve. And we are also quite sure that we know who the bad guys are. And the good guys, well, they're us, of course. And anyone else who is on our side, our team, our political party, our group, anyone who thinks like us and acts like us and looks like us. People have been forming tribes and alliances to keep the right ones in and the wrong ones out ever since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And that gets to the very heart of the story that Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke, a story that we have come to know as the Good Samaritan. That name is especially ironic because the Jews to whom Jesus first told this story would never have believed there could be a good Samaritan. The Samaritans were their deadly enemies, despised and unclean. The audience Jesus was speaking to when this story takes place was made up of ordinary Jews. 
And they would have been 100% into it as Jesus began to tell this parable because he starts out by putting the sanctimonious religious elite, the priests and the Levites, in their place, showing them to be more concerned about their religious purity and their nitpicky laws than about their fellow Jewish man who lies by the roadside, beaten and robbed and near death. So the listeners must have been happily awaiting the punchline, the moment where Jesus, having shown these self-righteous elites for what they really are, would show his preference for their group and make an ordinary Jew into the hero, the one who would stop and help the injured man. Instead, Jesus drops a bombshell Instead of saying, but an ordinary Jew, a regular guy, someone like all of you had pity on him, Jesus says, but a Samaritan had pity on him. The despised bad guy Samaritan has become the good guy, the hero. He's risked his money, his reputation, and his very life because this was a dangerous place they were in, for an enemy who, if he were conscious, would consider him a heathen dog and cross the road to avoid him. I'm sure if you stop and think for even a moment, you can come up with a person or a group of people that you disagree with in almost every way. Maybe they are the opposite of you in their political party or their religious beliefs or you think their lifestyle is completely wrong. Think of these people, picture them in your mind, and then realize that Jesus is saying they are your neighbor. They are people you are meant to serve. Jesus does not say you have to agree with them. He doesn't say you have to condone what they're doing. He doesn't say you have to support their sin. But he does say that you have to love them. And not just from a distance, but up close and personal. Jesus makes it crystal clear that you don't just have to care for your tribe, your family or your friends or those you approve of, but for whoever is standing right in front of you, even if that person is a stranger or an enemy. Have you heard of the term compassion fatigue? In our time of overwhelming information, it means that we see and hear about so many problems, hunger, disease, natural disasters, pandemics, shootings, wars, abuse, that we're just unable to process them all. We eventually tune out anything that doesn't personally affect us or our loved ones because we just can't cope with feeling everybody's pain. It's too much. So we become calloused. We stop paying attention because it hurts too much and we want to protect our hearts and our lives. It's true. It's easy to be overwhelmed. You look at all the hurting people. You look at all the ones who haven't heard about Jesus or who reject him outright or who are just too busy to care to give him a thought and you don't know where to start. The crowds are too large. The mission seems enormous and impossible. So you don't even try to begin. But Jesus answers those concerns by saying, it's personal. Instead of hiding from the pain or feeling overwhelmed, Jesus tells us to get personal, to look at just that one person he's placing in your path today. Help that one, love that one, whoever they are. There's a story you may have heard before, but I want to share it anyway. A young girl 
was walking along a beach where thousands of starfish had been washed up on shore during a terrible storm. They can't live out of the water for very long. So they were dying. As the girl walked along, every time she came to a starfish, she would pick it up and throw it back into the ocean. People watched her with amusement. She had been doing this for some time when a man approached her and said, little girl, why are you doing this? Look at this beach. It goes on for miles. There are thousands and thousands of starfish. You can't save them all. You can't even begin to make a difference. The girl thought about that for a moment. But then she bent down, picked up another starfish, and hurled it as far as she could into the ocean. She looked at the man and replied, well, I made a difference for that one. The little girl understood that it's personal, that God has given each one of us gifts and opportunities that are uniquely ours, that each person we meet, whether part of our tribe or not, is beloved by God and worthy of our care. But there's more to it than that. Jesus tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. But like the lawyer in the story, we instinctively know how impossible that is for us. We try to justify ourselves because we know how sinfully we cling to our pride, looking down on others, demonizing those who disagree with us or those who are different and therefore frightening. If we're honest with ourselves, we realize how short we fall of loving God and loving our neighbors as we're commanded to do. That's why the story of the Good Samaritan is also the story of Jesus himself, of a God who got personal, so personal that he got himself born as one of us and died to save us. Ultimately, the Good Samaritan is Jesus, the one who gave up everything for those who hated him and rejected him and refused to listen to him. And that includes you and me. As we hear in Romans chapter 5, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? This is what makes the Christian faith unique and the gospel truly amazing. It's not, get your life together, get cleaned up, and then you can come to God. The beautiful truth is that Jesus not only saves sinners, it's that Jesus only saves sinners. What that means is that even though you and I are rebellious and sinful enemies of God, he continues to love us. He loved us so much that he came down and was born as a human being. He suffered pain, grief, loneliness, and eventually death. And then he conquered death forever by rising from the grave. He did all this to make it personal, to redeem each one of you, his beloved children. This is the gift he offers in baptism, a personal, life-giving washing away of sin and a rising up to a new life in the Holy Spirit. That personal gift will be given to Judd in a few minutes, just as it was given to you on the day of your baptism. Never forget that God's love is personal.
and it's for you. Amen. Our hymn of the day is Be Thou My Vision, which is number 793 in the red hymnal. You want to come forward? Okay, I invite you to come up. In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, the body of Christ. Living with Christ and in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. I present judge for baptism. Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have your child baptized into Christ? I do. As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with him among God's faithful people, Bring him to the word of God and the Holy Supper. Teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Place in his hands the Holy Scriptures and nurture him in faith and prayer so that your child may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help your child grow in the Christian faith and life? I do. Sponsors, do you promise to nurture this child in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help him live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? I do. People of God, 
do you promise to support Jed and pray for him in his new life in Christ? I invite you all to stand and join with us in renouncing sin, death, and the devil and confessing our Christian faith. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Judd, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jed Charles Court, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Welcome to our newest member, Judd Court.
We always offer to each child who's baptized a copy of the Jesus Storybook Bible, which is just a fantastic uh, Bible for all ages, even us grown-ups. And so I, that's for him. And I also have a certificate for him. Okay. And one for each of you, too, as his sponsors. At this time, we will be singing Dearest Jesus, We Are Here, number 443 in the Red Hymnal.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in praise and thanksgiving for the new life that you have given to us. We thank you for Judd. We thank you for the blessing that he is and that he will be, and we thank you for his parents and sponsors and family who have understood your command to bring him here to be baptized in your name. Bless him always in all that he does. Bless his life as he grows, and bless his family as they support him and teach him to know you. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for all families. We pray that you would give parents the patience and the guidance that they need to raise their children to know you. We pray that you would give children obedience and wisdom as they grow and learn and live lives that are pleasing to you. Surround all families with your especial care. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the gift of rain where it has been received. We thank you so much, and we also pray for, for the places that are still in need of rain, Lord. Please send rain as it is needed, and be with those who are suffering from storms or damage to crops or any other natural disaster. Help us to help them in whatever way we may. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we lift up those who are grieving. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones or who are in vigil beside the bedside of those who are dying. Lift them up, sustain them, and give them the peace that only you can give. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we lift up those who are living lives that have been torn apart by war or violence. We pray for the people of Ukraine, the people in Afghanistan and elsewhere. We pray that you would uphold them, that you would turn them to you. And those who are perpetrating this violence, we pray that you would turn their hearts back to you and away from their hatred of their fellow brothers and sisters. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the whole Christian church on earth and particularly the church as it is persecuted for Christians who are suffering for bearing your name, Lord. We ask that you especially hold them up and surround them with your presence. We pray for Talik Emma and other Jews for Jesus missionaries in Ukraine and elsewhere that your Holy Spirit would be at work through what they say and do. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray in thanksgiving for all those who generously opened up their hearts to the people of Uganda and gave that wells might be dug and clean, fresh, healthy water be made available to more people who are your beloved children. Prosper the work of Water for Kids in Uganda and around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are ill those who are undergoing treatments, recovering from surgery, those who are homebound or have any other needs. We pray especially for Jillian, Amy Sue, Barb, Darlene, Sharon, Tana, Carl, Haley, Marianne, Daniel, Gary, Kyson, Scott, and all others whom we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, gracious Heavenly Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy, through the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is All People That on Earth Do Dwell, number 883. Please be seated. peace, serve the Lord.